Hey guys, Rambo here with a Dead Officer K3 video, where I'll be offering 100 tips and tricks for the game. A few things to mention before we start this rather lengthy video. About half of these tips will be specific to the wild area, then the rest of the information will be related more so to the regular arenas. Most of the stuff in this video will be geared towards intermediate level players, but there will be some tips for beginners as well, and I also think that more advanced players will learn a few things from the video too. Also, a select few of the tricks that will be mentioned here might border on being considered exploits, but in my opinion, anything included in this video does not disrupt the integrity of the core high round experience, so I don't have much hesitation in including some of those tricks here. Not to mention that most of such tricks are already utilized by top players. Finally, there will be timestamps in the description below if you want to skip around, and if any tips need to be amended in the future for whatever reason, that will be reflected in the description as well. Without further ado, let's get right into the video. You can monitor how much damage you have taken by observing the amount of redness on the soldier icon in your HUD. Your character regenerates 3 HP per second. When receiving damage in first person perspective, you typically have 1.5 seconds worth of invincibility before you can be damaged again, which helps prevent you from being double or triple slapped. However, this grace period does not apply when taking damage to lava, as most areas with lava will deplete your health very quickly, regardless of whether you're in top-down view or first person. While it does hurt you, full damage cannot kill the player in top-down view. However, if you are in first person perspective, you will die to full damage if you're low on health. Also, Fall damage does not exist in bonus areas or on normal arenas. In the first person playlist, your weapons will have a bit of damage fall off, where you have less range compared to the first person item pickup found in top down mode. With most fates, the max number of lives that you could have at once is 9. When you're at 9 lives and earn enough points for yet another life, you'll be given one of the following three rewards, boxing gloves, coat of arms, or a skeleton army. In deadly dungeons, and even other parts of the game, you can actually move slightly faster than normal by running along walls at a certain angle. When dropping into a deadly dungeon, there are a couple icons you should look out for on your minimap. The first is this boss icon on your radar, which signifies that there is a Margwa guarding a fate stone in your dungeon. Margwas are pretty rare for solo, but the likelihood of encountering one increases with the more players you have in your match, since dungeons usually are bigger with an increased player count. The second icon you should be on the lookout for in dungeons is two dots with an upside down V above them, which signifies that there is a Dark Crypt bonus area in that dungeon. The two dots on your radar are the gladiators on a different elevation level, guarding the crypt entrance. If you discover a Dark Crypt in a deadly dungeon, then the rest of the wild area will have some aesthetic changes, such as green water, and the wild will also be set in the nighttime as well, which represents a passage of time for deep dungeon exploration. While Margwas can be found in any of the four deadly dungeons, it is not possible to discover a dark crypt in the Grotte de la Dorta dungeon specifically. If you manage to get two or more Margwas in a specific deadly dungeon, then they all will be guarding the same exact fate stone. For example, if there are two Margwas in your dungeon, and the first stone you see in that dungeon is the fate of Furious Feet, then the second stone in that same dungeon will also be Furious Feet. There is actually a recent bug related to when you have multiple Margwas in a singular dungeon, where you can only obtain one of the Fate Stones sometimes. Nothing too concrete is known about this bug, but it seems to be caused either by having everyone near the first Fate Stone when it is being grabbed, or by having the player who grabs that first Fate Stone enter into a different Margwa room in that dungeon. So regardless of which of these two situations might be the culprit, my advice would be the same. When you have two or more Margwas in your dungeon, let just one player enter the first Margo room and grab the Fate Stone without anybody near them. Then do the same thing with the other Margo rooms, but of course with a different player entering those rooms instead. Anyways, it's also worth noting that if there's a Furious Fate Stone in one dungeon, then that Fate Stone cannot reappear in subsequent dungeons for that specific match. And finally, if you are super lucky, you can find a maximum of three Margwas in one specific dungeon. Likewise, it is possible to receive up to three Dark Crypts in a specific dungeon as well. After opening past the first set of doors in the wild, you can utilize a shortcut by using a speed boost along this cliff to the right, which if done correctly, can launch your player pretty far, usually towards the Dark Crypt area. There are a few important things to mention related to the health of mini-bosses in the wild. First off, if you bring mini-bosses too far away from their original spawn point, they will eventually despawn and return with full health. Secondly, mini-bosses have passive healing whenever they do not have a proper player target, and the same principle also applies to the zombie head spawners. And finally, even when the health bar for a mini-boss disappears, they will usually still be briefly alive with super low HP, so be sure to put a few extra bullets into them before thinking that they're actually dead. The six arm guys in the wild could be trapped in a few areas. The one near the dark crypt can be trapped when trying to pass underneath its bridge, 
and the one near the gem pillars can be trapped when trying to enter this little room with a spring pad. As a side note, I will be calling this dude the six arm guy throughout this video, rather than the Giganese. So don't say, well Rambo, his name is actually, oh, I don't care. The two flogger traps near the Kaboom Room can actually be bypassed while active. This one here could be passed by going through either side of the trap, whereas the flogger closer to the Kaboom Room can only be passed through this side. Similarly, you could pass by the flogger on the volcano by going along the left side of the trap. Additionally, if you have the Furious Feet, it is possible to time it correctly to where you run past an active flogger, although this is a very risky endeavor to attempt in top-down view. If you eliminate zombie spawners from a far distance or from a different elevation level where they might not have a proper player target, then the game will only award you with 100 XP rather than the typical 350 XP. Whenever an elephant is killed in the wild, their corpse will explode 10 seconds after death, which deals near full damage to the player in first person perspective and partial damage to the player in top down view. Near the bat spawners, there's a big white gem inside a locked cage. In order to access this gem on solo, obtain a doom buggy and park it on top of the nearby pressure plate, which then opens the gate and allows you to collect the gem. In order to access the guaranteed key spawn on top of this tower near the kaboom room, the easiest method is to be in first person perspective, use this spring pad over here by the gem pillars, build some momentum towards your right, then use a speed boost towards the back left portion of the tower, which if done correctly, will land you near the key and other loot. You can access this lock cage at the beginning of the wild without spending a key on the door. In order to do this on co-op, have a teammate stand on the pressure plate over here, and then hop on the lowered lift. Ask them kindly to step off the pressure plate, which will elevate you back towards the top. Once you're up here, aim your weapon where I'm shooting at, then use a speed boost towards the cage. You can then escape the cage via the spring pad inside. If you're playing solo, you'll need to grab a nearby first person item, stand on the pressure plate, which lowers the lift, aim your weapon towards the outer right portion of the lift, then jump and use a speed boost, which should put you on the side of the lift. Then once the lift is raised, just jump and boost over towards the cage. There's also another lift near the kaboom room which brings you to a first person item pickup. On solo, you can park a doom buggy over on this pressure plate, then slowly shoot one bullet at a time towards the car until it catches on fire. Quickly hop on the lowered lift, and then wait for the car to explode and despawn, which raises the lift and brings you to the top. Just be sure not to drive your dune buggy underneath the lift over here, or else the car will explode. On co-op, you could of course just have your teammate stand on the pressure plate in order to interact with the lift. Near the second elephant is a locked cage which can contain anywhere from 0 to 2 extra lives. You can access this area without spending a key by driving a dune buggy towards the cage, and then using the car's boost feature to get inside. Sometimes you could have a bit of trouble driving your way out of the cage with the dune buggy, so this tactic can be a bit risky for solo. The dune buggy could also be used in a similar fashion to get inside the beginning lock cage, in case you needed a second way to access that area without spending a key. If you wanted a third solo method to get inside the beginning lock cage, you could park a dune buggy on the pressure plate over here, hop on the lift, shoot the car, wait for it to despawn, then once you're elevated, use a speed boost towards the cage area. Just be sure not to drive your dune buggy underneath the lift here, or else the car will explode. If you manage to destroy all the dune buggies over here, you can actually respawn all four of them by entering any of the deadly dungeons. When playing the top-down mode on co-op, if you enter a dune buggy, precisely when your teammate drops into the Grotte de la Dorta dungeon, you will remain in first-person perspective for the remainder of the wild. You can also accomplish a similar trick on solo, though it's a bit tougher to replicate. In the very bottom of your settings, have Tap to Interact enabled, and then spam your Interact button near a dune buggy, so that you repeatedly enter and exit the car. Eventually, it'll glitch out to where you are in first-person perspective, which you'll be able to stay in for the remainder of the wild. When trying to do this trick, you should only really match your button for a few seconds at a time, just in case it does put you into first person, because if you keep spamming the interact button and never stop, you might accidentally enter back into the doom buggy, and going back into the car will revert you to top down view, so you of course don't want that to happen. In the top down mode, you can constantly enter and exit a doom buggy in order to gain invincibility frames, which can help you eliminate nearby enemies with ease. Doing this will also fully regenerate your health. It is also worth knowing that any weapon you pick up on the map will be removed whenever you enter a dune buggy. If you leave a bunch of enemies alive near locked doors, those doors will actually take longer to render in than normal, allowing you to use speed boosts to bypass those doors without spending a key. For example, you could use a few speed boosts to get by all three locked doors in this area before they actually appear. This trick can also be utilized with other doors, such as the first door just past the abandoned temple, where it's helpful to hoard up nearby zombies in order to produce more entities on the map. You could also do it with the door at the very beginning of the round 20 wild, as you'll want to immediately spam your speed boosts during the round transition screen. For the doors near the second elephant, it's also helpful to hoard up some zombies, bats, or hellhounds, but having too many of these enemies on the map will actually prevent the elephant from spawning in, which isn't ideal for this trick. 
Consistency in reproducing this trick may also vary depending on your platform, player count, and mode. You can actually access part of the Blightfather path in the wild without having to spend keys in that direction. Stand over here near the gem pillars area, shoot the six-armed guy as he's making his way up the stairs, which can trigger him into using his special attacks. And when you see that he's about to use his shield blast attack, quickly take the nearby spring pad, and his blast will then propel you even further into the air. Then use a speed boost towards the upper cliff, and you'll usually land near the Blightfather enemy. Just beware of full damage. It's important to make sure that the 6 arm enemy is on a lower elevation than you when he utilizes his shield blast attack. So if he gets to the top area with you over here, just bring him downstairs, get some distance between the two of you, and try again. If you get poor timing with this trick or do it incorrectly, it is possible to get stuck near some of the rocks and other terrain, in which case you may be permanently stuck there on solo, although usually you can escape certain areas by dropping down or using speed boosts. So there's a bit of risk involved, but once you get the trick down, it is very helpful and easy to replicate, as there are three potential key spawns you can access here, along with a bunch of other loot. After you're done exploring that area, you can then drop down near the bat spawners, reconnecting you to the main part of the wild. This trick can also be utilized while in the top-down mode as well. When fighting the Blightfather in top-down mode, you can constantly exit and re-enter this cave area, which allows you to repeatedly gain about 10 seconds of invincibility, as the cave area has first-person perspective that is forced on the player. It's also very helpful to grab these five chickens when fighting the Blightfather as well. There are a couple of speed boost shortcuts that you could utilize in the volcano area. The first one is towards the beginning of the volcano, just past the first set of traps. In top-down mode, flip your camera and stand a bit to the left of this bigger rock. Aim around here and then use a speed boost, which if done correctly, has the potential to launch you all the way towards the bridge area. Sometimes this boost trick only launches you up one level over by the dragon heads, in which case you have the option to utilize a second boost trick. Make sure your camera is still flipped, and then aim over here and use a speed boost, which if done correctly, will take you over to this area, containing anywhere from 0 to 2 extra lives, and which also has a spring pad which takes you to the bridge area. You could also obtain these potential extra lives without having to use a speed boost. On solo, flip your camera near the beginning of the bridge area, and then slowly make your way along this tiny ledge. Just keep moving along, and it'll eventually drop you off near the lives and spring pad. On co-op, you can have a teammate stand on this pressure plate by the blue altar, which raises the player on the lift at the very bottom of the volcano. When fighting the werewolf at the top of the volcano, there are a few things to keep in mind. Firstly, having your player hug the wall will actually prevent the werewolf from utilizing his lunge attack. Secondly, if the werewolf is lunging at the player, you can sometimes avoid damage by tackling him and then quickly pulling away. This is a very risky trick to pull off successfully, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend it unless under dire circumstances. And finally, the werewolf will regenerate slightly less health for each subsequent heal that he performs. In order to determine which fate is which in the Room of Fate, you'll have to look at the shape and color of the stones. Here's a quick graphic showing the stone associated with each fate. In order for the stones to appear like this in the Room of Fate for you, rather than looking identical, you will have to provide keys to the Blue Altar, which is located near the bridge on the volcano. In solo and two-player matches, you only have to provide one key in order to reveal the fates. However, in 3-player and 4-player matches, you must provide two keys in order to reveal all the fates. If you provide just one key in 3- and 4-player matches, then only one of the six fate zones will have a distinguishable pattern. There are two other tidbits related to the Blue Altar that are worth mentioning. If you're playing a 3- or 4-player match, you can have players back out until there are only two players in your game, then drop into the nearby dungeon. When you exit that dungeon, you will only have to provide one key to the Blue Altar in order to reveal fates since the game now thinks you're in a two-player match. Then your teammates who previously backed out can rejoin the match, without ever having to spend a second key on the Blue Altar. Also, there is a bug related to the Blue Altar that you should avoid. In three and four-player matches, if you spend just one key on the Blue Altar, then drop into the dungeon with your full squad, you will then have to spend an additional two keys on the Altar whenever you return from that dungeon, in order to fully reveal the fates. So basically, only spend keys on the altar whenever you're ready to deposit all of them at once. In order to unlock bonus areas like the Abandoned Temple, Dark Crypt, Kaboom Room, and Akari Exit later into your match, you will first have to enter them in the wild. As such, unless your starting arena checkpoint is a very early round, you will not encounter these rooms when playing the solo advanced start mode. In top-down mode, you have the ability to flip your camera not only in the general wild area, but also inside the Deadly Dungeons, the Abandoned Temple, and the Dark Crypt. However, you cannot flip your camera inside these bonus areas if you encounter them after the wild. Additionally, if you try flipping your camera in the Kaboom Room, your controls will be inverted while inside that room. The next few tips will deal with the Akari Exit bonus area, found near the beginning of the volcano. We'll now go over several methods to reach the Akari entrance across the lava. Keep in mind that all these methods carry some bit of risk, so practice them a bit and see which one you're most comfortable with. 
On co-op, you could have your teammate stand on the pressure plate over here, which reveals a plank. Carefully transition yourself from the first movement platform towards the plank, then slowly walk along it, and make sure you don't get knocked over by the second movement platform. Once you're over on this side, you could check the top area for a potential key, and then spend a key on the left door in order to access Akari. On solo, a method that I like to use for top-down mode is to wait for the two movement platforms to align at the bottom, then use a speed boost towards the second platform. Once you're on it, wait for that platform to reach this area up here, and then use another speed boost towards the Megaton. You could also employ this method whenever the platforms align in the middle area as well. The downside to this method is that it requires patience in waiting for the two platforms to perfectly align. If you're playing first person mode, or even if you're playing top down mode and obtain a nearby first person item from earlier in the wild, you could utilize a different method, where you step on the pressure plate yourself, which reveals the plank. You could then jump over towards the plank, and while the plank will visually disappear, you can actually still move along it. Try to keep yourself towards the left side of the plank, and use a nuke while sprinting as well, as to avoid lava damage. Also make sure to time it correctly, as you don't want to be sprinting along the plank as the second moving platform is making its way towards you, as it will knock you down into the lava if you collide with it. Another method you could use in first person perspective is to stand over here on the first moving platform, then build a little bit of forward momentum, jump, and use a speed boost to the back corner area which if done correctly, will bring you by the boxes. One final method that I'll mention here is to come over to this vantage point in the volcano and then use a jump boost towards the second moving platform. Do this one at your own risk, as sometimes you can get stuck on some barriers. If you manage to fall in the lava at some point during your Akari entrance endeavors, not all hope is lost. If you're in first person perspective, it's possible to get back to safety under certain conditions. First off, if you ever fall into the lava, you should almost immediately use a nuke as they grant yourself 3 seconds of invincibility so you don't get instantly melted by the lava. Then there's a couple spots where you can jump and use a speed boost to get back to safety, such as right over here, or if you're on the other side by the entrance, you can aim over here and then use a jump boost. On co-op, it's helpful to have one of your teammates stand by the entrance of a nearby dungeon or bonus area, as this allows your teammate to warp you back to safety in case you manage to fall into the lava and can't make your way out. In the Akari exit bonus area itself, you can open this closed door by spending a key on this specific chest, which reveals a pressure plate that you can stand on. Behind the door will be a Margwa and three random items, which can include keys. When inside this room, be sure not to jump while in the back, as you will hit a death barrier and die. To kill the Margwa easily, just be sure to leave the second key chest over here unopened, as the Margwa will run up to you and get stuck behind the chest, allowing you to easily shoot him. A similar method could also be utilized with the six arm guy earlier in the level too. When playing Akari Exit on co-op, opening the magic barrier at the end of the level will typically teleport all your teammates towards you, unless one of them is dead in the lava area, in which case, they are not warped. Additionally, whenever someone interacts with this magic barrier, most everything from earlier in the level, such as traps and spring pads, will despawn, but key chests will remain intact. In Akari Exit, you can access the gym area on both solo and co-op without having to spend a key. Normally, on co-op, the intended way to get to that area is to spend a key on this door, which contains a pressure plate that raises the lift over here, which a teammate would then stand on in order to be brought up to the goodies above. But opening this door is usually a waste of a key, as there's not much of value inside this room. So instead, the method I would recommend is to stand over here on this top right area, near the three speed boosts, then jump and use a speed boost towards your point of view, then turn to the side and quickly use a second speed boost towards the gym area in the top left. If you're playing first person mode, you'll want to stand in a slightly different spot, then aim right over there where I'm looking at, towards the top of that object in the distance, use a jump boost, then turn your camera and use a second speed boost towards the gems. Also, while in first person perspective, when you're by the Nosferatu spawners, you can look up and see if there are any keys at the top gem area, which might help you decide if the boost trick is worth doing in your match. In Akari Exit, if you manage to fall in the lava area on your way to the end of the level, you can actually get back to safety by jumping over here and then using a speed boost towards the traps. In first person perspective, you can simply jump back to safety without having to use a speed boost. Again, just make sure you immediately use a nuke if you're about to fall into the lava, or else you'll get burned almost immediately. In Akari Exit, players in top-down mode have the ability to sprint and slide when moving north. Additionally, this sprinting mechanic for top-down also works well inside of Silverback Slideways, although it's a little more difficult to consistently do, as it only really works when you're against a wall barrier. When playing the first-person playlist specifically, players have the ability to crouch and slide while inside of Akari Exit and Silverback Slideways. However, this crouching ability does not carry over to the first person item found in top down mode for Akari. In top down mode, if you have a teammate rejoin a match in the wild while you're in either Akari Exit or Silverback Slideways, they will be sent to the beginning of the wild area while the rest of the team is still inside the bonus area. While in the wild, 
they can move around in a different perspective, and even have the option to teleport, which allows you to play the first few rounds with different mechanics, such as sprinting, jumping, and then when you take a death, it'll sometimes even bring you into a different perspective as well. If you discover another bonus room, or whenever the timer at the top of your screen for the original bonus area is set to expire, everything will reset back to normal. Before we conclude our tips for the beginning wild area, I want to explain a couple of more advanced strategies. The first one we'll talk about is referred to as the double wild. The double wild is when you explore either everything, or most everything, in the round 4 wild, then intentionally use a teleporter to leave the area, rather than entering the Room of Fate. By doing so, you'll be able to enter the wild a second time after round 20. On the round 4 wild, some players will teleport once they've collected everything up until this door near the third dungeon, whereas some other players will open up everything towards the volcano, explore it all for extra points, then use the teleporter after that. In order for this double wild strategy to work to its full extent, you'll want to make sure you have approximately 4 keys saved up once you decide to teleport. Whenever you end up taking the portal to the round 20 wild, you cannot open the door behind you, as it has a blockade from both sides. So instead you'll have to work your way around. First, you'll have to open a door over here at the start, or you could try using a speed boost by it before it renders in, as mentioned earlier in the video. Then you have to open the two doors past the blue altar, leading back towards the Blyfather path and middle drop-off area, which reconnects with the main wild. All zombie spawners, gems, chests, and baskets will reappear here in the round 20 wild. However, any mini-bosses killed on the round 4 wild will not reappear on round 20, so be sure not to kill the 6 arm guy by the gem pillars on round 4, as you'll have to utilize his shield blast trick mentioned earlier in the video in order to get back up to the Blyfather path once you've collected all the loot in the bottom section. In regard to key spawns, any keys that appeared on round 4 cannot reappear on round 20. However, there is potential to receive key spawns in locations where they previously did not appear, although this is of course not guaranteed. Also, you cannot re-enter deadly dungeons or bonus areas unless you did not enter them on the round 4 wild. The one exception is that you can re-enter the arcade machine, but that will require opening up another door or two towards the beginning area, which players will typically do for the extra points and potential keys. This door over here by the second teleporter is usually worth opening up as well on round 20, unless you got all potential key spawns to appear there on round 4, in which case you might not want to waste a key on this door. The whole premise of the double wild is score-centric, basically being able to eliminate a bunch of zombie spawners and collect loot while having an already high score multiplier, and hoping that you sort of come close to breaking even with additional key spawns to counterbalance the keys spent on doors. Then when you're finished exploring everything, make sure you enter the Room of Fate on the round 20 wild, as you won't be able to access it again with this specific double wild strategy. Now we will explain what is meant by the triple wild strategy. Again, this is more so an advanced tactic for players looking for additional score and a high 9 times score multiplier. In order to do the triple wild, you essentially cannot enter the middle wild area, so don't bother opening any doors on round 4. If your arcade machine appears behind the first locked door, you'll want to restart your game for better luck. Take the first teleporter over here once you've explored everything in the beginning and have a decent score multiplier. Then on the round 20 wild, you open up the door, explore the volcano, and enter the Room of Fate. As a side note, it is worth mentioning that if you have zero keys at the start of the round 20 wild, the game will spawn a guaranteed key near you, allowing you to open the door. Anyways, since you never entered the middle wild area on either the round 4 or 20 wild, the game will present both a teleporter and green portal to you on round 36 complete, so be sure to take the portal to the round 36 wild. This wild will start you over here, so you'll never have to open the two doors behind you, unless you have a bunch of keys and want to backtrack for some extra points and an additional arcade machine. You also get to explore all the bonus areas and dungeons that you previously didn't enter, and whenever you're done, since you already have your fate and cannot enter the Room of Fate again, just take the teleporter and continue on with your run. Now we're going to talk about some tips and tricks for the wild area that appears after completing round 60. If you want to earn extra points and XP in the round 60 wild, you could grab one of the many first person items scattered around, and make your way over to this hidden area in the top left part of the map. After clearing nearby enemies, you can actually shoot several zombie spawners that would normally appear earlier in the wild. You only get 100 XP for these heads since they're very far away, but it's a decent way to earn extra score, since each head awards over 5,000 points on solo while on a one-time score multiplier. On co-op, dropping into the Skeleton King boss area will teleport all your teammates to this room as well, so be sure to collect everything you want before entering here, as there's no way back to the previous playing area. Before entering the Skeleton King boss area, you can actually eliminate the first skeleton spawner simply by shooting through the wall over here. On co-op, you can utilize this pressure plate and lift by the flogger in order to access the top area, which contains a potential key spawn and other loot. On solo, there are actually two methods to access this top area. 
The first method, and the easier one, is to be in first person perspective, then wait until the 6 arm enemy is about to use his shield blast attack, and then jump as he's about to blast you, which if done correctly, will launch you backwards into the air, where you'll then have to use a speed boost to get over to the top area. There's also an alternate way of getting up here on solo, though it's more luck dependent. You will need to have 9 lives already, and be close to earning enough points for yet another life. Shoot a nearby zombie spawner, or kill the 6 arm enemy, then stand on the pressure plate. You then have a 1 in 3 chance of being awarded a skeleton army as your 10th life reward, as mentioned earlier in the video. If you get the skeleton army and there's no nearby enemies, they will typically stand on the pressure plate, allowing you to quickly make your way over to the lowered lift. The skeletons will eventually despawn, which then raises the lift, allowing you to access the spring pads, which lead to the top area. In order to open the locked cage, containing two white gems and a potential extra life, you'll need one of your teammates to stand on this hidden pressure plate near the bushes in the top area, which opens the gate below. Once inside the locked cage area, it is possible for your player to get stuck in a barrier if you go too far left, so be careful of this pitfall. And for our final wild tip, in the round 60 wild, you can actually backtrack to the round 4 wild area. In order to do so, you have to be on co-op, and you'll either have to be playing the first person playlist or use your first person items very efficiently if you're playing the top down mode. Have a teammate stand on the pressure plate by the flogger, which lowers the lift. Then bring the six arm guy onto the lift, although it may take a bit of time until he cooperates. Once he's on the lift, he's just gonna stand there unless you move too far away from him, so then just send the player up on the lift with him while they're in first person perspective. While here, you'll have to dodge some spear attacks and put some bullets into him until he utilizes his shield blast attack. Once you see him doing this, you'll want to immediately take this nearby spring pad. As a side note, it's also helpful to jump just before taking this spring pad, which if done correctly, allows you to do what is called a super jump, which gives you more elevation than normal. You can practice the super jump earlier in the wild, or during the Mama's House arena, since you take no full damage on regular arenas. If your character is taken super high on this arena, and then immediately sent back down to ground level, you know that you did the super gem correctly. Anyways, back to the round 60 wild. After taking the spring pad, the six arm guy will shield blast you even further into the air. Then you'll have to use approximately three speed boosts towards the eagle by the kaboom room, which will bring you to the earlier wild area, with the potential to get extra keys, loot, and score. Your teammates can also be warped to this area by entering an arcade machine. Then when you're ready to leave, you can take a teleporter which brings you to round 61, without ever having to fight the Skeleton King. The way this wild area operates is pretty much the same as the double and triple wild strategies mentioned earlier in the video, so keys that appeared before cannot reappear again, etc etc. When doing this boost trick, it's important to keep in mind that there are a lot of invisible barriers in the sky that may hold your progress, and there's also some areas where you could get stuck in as well. Now we're going to discuss some general tips for normal arenas. With most fates or no fate, you start each round with a minimum of one speed boost and one nuke. Since you start the game with just one nuke, you may as well use it during the first three rounds of gameplay, as you'll always be bumped up to one nuke the following round. However, if you're about to enter a wild area, your armory will not be replenished when entering it. In top down mode, the first person item offers various benefits. It lasts for 90 seconds, it gives you a minimum 4 times score multiplier during normal rounds, a mini map radar, you have about 10 seconds of invincibility whenever you enter the item pickup, and another 3 seconds of invincibility whenever you exit it. You have the ability to move quicker by sprinting, the option to both jump and slide, and you also have the ability to take 3 hits before death, with health regeneration as well. Most enemies only provide partial damage in first person perspective, but the following enemies will provide near full damage to you in first person. The Warden Smack, attacks from Megatons and Megaton Splits, Mini Bosses, and the Mama Back. On the island arena, if you stand in this spot of the water, you will immediately exit through the nearby doorway whenever the round ends, assuming the exit door appears in that specific location. A bit of a speedrun tactic. Speaking of speedruns, if you have your teammate rejoin a match during the Mama Back cinematic on round 4, they will be able to move around during the cutscene, allowing them to obtain treasure and enter the green portal about 4 seconds faster than it would normally take to do so. On round 21, or the first round of the Temple Arena, there is a hole in the middle of the map with some random goodies. In order to obtain these items, you could jump into this hole with an invincibility ring, or you could jump in while in first person perspective and only take partial damage. Also, when dropping into this middle hole on the Temple Arena, or even when using a nuke on this specific arena, several Shadow Boogie enemies will spawn into the map. On the round 29 underboss battle, Six Arms in a Hot Tub, the round will end a few seconds after defeating the Six Arm guy, so be sure to eliminate him as soon as possible. Also, when fighting the six-arm enemy outside of the wild, such as on this round, his shield blast attack will still stun the player, but it will not damage you. 
Around 41, or the first round of the Blood Pool Arena, there are three nukes that you could obtain at the top of the waterfall to your right. You could collect them two different ways, either by using a speed boost towards the top, or by getting a tank to randomly spawn in and driving it up the cliff. There are a couple things to keep in mind with the Warden enemy. Firstly, during normal rounds, the Warden will sometimes utilize his ground slam attack, but only when there's no valid player target, such as when the Warden is stuck near a group of friendly skeletons. And secondly, Wardens do not die from nukes. Enemies in the game have something called anticipation logic, where they sort of predict your movement path and try cutting you off. This logic can be manipulated a bit, most notably in the Mama's House arena that first appears on round 53, where you can manipulate the AI near fences by swaying back and forth with your player, giving you more time to kill the enemies before they reach your camp and spot. This AI manipulation also applies to a lesser extent on other arenas, where you can sway back and forth to your advantage. On the round 61 underboss battle, three mouths to feed, on co-op, you will be able to insta-kill the Margwa if players shoot in its direction as soon as it spawns in. While a bit more difficult to accomplish, players can also insta-kill other underbosses on co-op, such as the Blightfather that appears on round 37. However, you will earn no XP or loot for insta-killing these mini-bosses, and it also cannot be done on solo. On the round 64 boss fight, whenever the Mamaback is standing completely still, that means she is about to initiate her multi-boost attack. If you use a nuke towards the end of this idle animation, she will typically cancel her boost attack, but the sound effect for her using her boost will still play. Additionally, whenever you use a nuke or inflict a high level of damage to the Mama Back, she is more likely to use her jetpack attack to avoid damage. After completing a Mama Back boss fight, you have the option to spend keys on Mama's armory basket at the top of the map. The way it works is it provides you either a nuke or a speed boost in exchange for one key. If you're lower on nukes, it will provide a nuke over a speed boost. If you're maxed on both nukes and speed boost, it will then provide an extra life. And if you're maxed out on lives, nukes, and speed boost, then it will provide multiple temporary chickens. Here's a handy chart that you can pause on, which shows you the max number of keys that could be spent on the armory cart depending on the round and player count. There are a few differences between solo and co-op scaling that are worth mentioning. As alluded to earlier in the video, the number of rooms generated in deadly dungeons and cavernous cellars will typically be larger with an increased player count, which increases your chances of finding good loot, potential fate zones, dark crypts, etc. The amount of gems provided by the umbrella item also scales with player count. The amount of health that mini bosses, the mama back, and zombie head spawners have is also dependent on the number of players in your match. For each extra player in the game, bosses will have an additional 70% health when compared to solo. As for normal rounds, the individual Megaton split that first appears on round 66 will also have its health scale with both an increase in player count and round. The Gladiators also have more health on co-op, but other special enemies such as the Megaton and Warden have static health throughout the game, with the exception of the Wild, where the Megatons will have scaled health on co-op. Normal zombie types during rounds will also have their health slightly scaled with more players, but not in the way you would expect. If we use the damage numbers as the basis of discussion for zombie health, zombies will start at 100 HP on round 1 for all player categories. But it isn't until you enter the wild area that things start to diverge. For solo, entering any wild area will add 50 HP to zombie health for the following round. For 2 player matches, doing this will add 75 HP to zombie health. In 3 player matches, it adds 100 HP. And finally, for 4 player matches, entering any wild will add 125 HP. The wild areas after both round 4 and 60 are of course forced, so you can avoid these health increases. But if you get your fate on round 4, you will not enter either the round 20 or 36 wild, which prevents a health increase from occurring during those rounds. Also, in solo advanced start mode, the starting health of zombies on most of the arena checkpoints will be considerably lower when compared to the normal solo mode. Here's a quick chart showing how the damage numbers for standard zombies will differentiate on round 61 specifically, depending on how many wild areas you enter and what your player count is. Regular wild means entering the room of fate on round 4, the double wild is entering the round 20 wild, and the triple wild is entering both the round 20 and 36 wild. Since there are no more wild areas after this point on round 61, the damage numbers will increase by an expected 10 HP for each additional round, regardless of player count. Most enemies in the game award 100 points for killing them on a one-time score multiplier, but there are a few special enemies who actually give you even more score. On a one-time score multiplier, the Megaton splits are worth 200 points each, Gladiators are worth 250 points, Wardens are worth 350 points, and Megatons are worth 500 points. Additionally, many bosses such as the Werewolf are worth 5,000 points, and the Mama Back is worth 20,000 points. On co-op, 
After completing round 64, the AI's targeting of players will actually change. On rounds 1 to 64, there is a mechanic called load balance, where enemies will try to target everyone on the map, even if the player they're targeting isn't the closest one to them. After round 64, load balance is removed, and enemy target selection is instead weighted entirely towards proximity. Rounds in the game are essentially time-based. Here's a chart you can pause on which shows the average length of rounds on the different arenas. In case you don't notice the trend, about 10 seconds are added to round length whenever you enter a new arena. Once you beat round 64, the game of course cycles through again, with the round length essentially doubling, starting at about 6 minutes on round 65, and then capping out at around 8 minutes once you get closer to the round 128 boss fight. The same trend continues after that, where rounds double once again, lasting 12 to 16 minutes apiece between rounds 129 to 192. However, something interesting happens on your fourth playthrough of the arenas, as the rounds no longer double in length. Instead, the increase in round length is sort of just an incremental continuation of previous rounds, as rounds 193 to 256 will take anywhere from 17 to 20 minutes each. The Room of Judgment appears after completing round 65, and allows everyone in the match to obtain a guaranteed second fate if they don't already have one. In order to be able to reveal the fates here, you need to complete three waves in the time windows provided. If you have the Fate of Firepower, you can bring a different weapon into the Room of Judgment, and then drop that weapon before it expires. You will then have a red death machine for the remainder of the Room of Judgment. Also taking a death during the Room of Judgment with any fate will sometimes result in this temporary upgrade to your primary weapon as well. In wave 2 of the Room of Judgment, you will have to eliminate a bunch of meatballs within a certain time period. Sometimes the meatballs glitch out and are difficult to locate, in which case, be sure to have a few nukes saved up in order to use them near doorways and potentially kill the final couple of hidden meeples before the timer expires. The amount and type of mini-bosses that can appear in Wave 3 of the Room of Judgment varies depending on the number of players in your match. On Solo, you will always be guaranteed to fight one Margwa. In two-player matches, you will always fight just one mini-boss, but it could be either a Margwa, Werewolf, or a Six-Arm Guy. And then in three-player and four-player matches, you will have to face off against two mini-bosses, which can be some combination of a Margwa, Werewolf, or Six-Arm Guy. In addition to fighting many bosses on Wave 3, there will also be gladiators that appear during the fight. These enemies appear precisely every 20 seconds, so keep an eye on the timer in order to anticipate when they will spawn in next. The amount of time given to clear Wave 3 the Room of Judgment also varies depending on the number of players in your match. In solo matches, you will have 100 seconds to clear the wave. In two-player matches, the timer is 80 seconds. For three-player matches, the timer is 65 seconds. And finally, for four-player matches, the timer is 50 seconds. The max number of fates that a specific player can have at once is two. If you try obtaining a third fate at any point in your match, the game will tell you that you are already too powerful. With the fate of eternal friendship, your golden chicken will gain an upgrade whenever you complete round 64. However, in order for this upgrade to take effect, you must first pick up a weapon on the map. So be sure to do this on round 65, so that the friendship player can bring a red chicken into the room of judgment for increased damage. With the fate of firepower, weapons that you pick up start at full red power in your HUD. However, there is a bug in the game where picking up a gun while your current weapon is red but depleted will transfer that depleted power over to your new weapon, rather than starting you at full red power again. In order to avoid this bug, just drop your weapon if it's lower than the purple tier, then pick up the new weapon that you want. With the Fate of Blessings, many items last 80% longer. However, the following items do not last longer with this fate. The Gem Umbrella, Fast Boots, Arcade Machine, Skeleton Army, Coat of Arms, Vortex, and Monkey Bomb. If you manage to completely max out your 9x score multiplier, which takes a lot of loot to accomplish, the game will reward you by providing everyone in the lobby with maximum lives, nukes, speed boosts, and keys. You will also receive 2500 XP. With the Coat of Arms item, any turn zombies shot by the player will return back to the enemy team, so be sure to avoid firing at zombies with a symbol above them. When grabbing the top hat item, the direction that you're facing towards while obtaining the hat will dictate the location that the clones spawn in. Additionally, it is possible for you or your teammates to kill friendly clones if you shoot them enough. With the Boxing Gloves item, you can just spin around quickly to kill zombies in the vicinity. Just beware of special enemies that shoot or throw stuff at you. Also keep in mind that zombies can sometimes smack you through the gloves if you are on a slightly different elevation level, such as a staircase. The Boxing Gloves and other shield items are also very effective against meatballs, as you could usually quickly eliminate one before they split into the air. Weapons such as the Crossbow, Rocket Launcher, and Grenade Launcher are all skilled weapons, meaning that they don't lose their effectiveness against normal zombies as the rounds progress. However, these weapons do not scale the same way against ground spawners and other special enemies. When shooting the shotgun weapon, your player will actually move slightly slower when compared to your movement with the RPD. On a similar note, your player moves slightly faster when shooting the rocket launcher and moving backwards. 
When you have a shotgun equipped in first person perspective, aiming down your sights will allow you to melt boss enemies much quicker when compared to using hip fire, as there is less bullet spread. Also, when shooting a regular shotgun in first person perspective, you can actually increase your fire rate by spamming the shoot button in increments, rather than just holding on the trigger. In first person perspective, you can enable auto sprint in your controller settings, which sort of makes it easier to move faster. Basically, every time you start the sprint animation, you will have a slight bump in movement speed. So being able to stop and start sprinting every few seconds by simply moving your analog forward rather than constantly clicking it down is a bit helpful for some players. In top-down mode specifically, if you have a first-person item and then a vehicle spawns in, grabbing that vehicle will then exit you out of first-person perspective. On co-op, when playing in first-person perspective, use caution when deciding whether or not to pick up the sprinkler item on the map, as it causes temporary screen shaking for non-host players. On co-op, you can press up on the D-pad to donate one of your lives to a downed teammate with zero lives. By doing so, you also receive some life donation rewards. When donating life, you are guaranteed to receive at least three max ammos, which temporarily upgrades your weapon, and then you also can receive a combination of the following rewards. A magnet, saw blades, chickens, speed boosts, nukes, boxing gloves, an extra life, and even a 1% chance of a key. Of course, some of these life donation rewards are more common than others. On co-op, if you have multiple teammates downed, and you decide to donate a life to one of them, it will revive the teammate who is located closest to the player. On co-op, after completing round 64, life donations will become forced on the player, meaning that if a player dies and has zero lives, it will automatically take a life from a teammate in order to revive them, in exchange for life donation rewards. This forced life donation system has a cooldown of 2 minutes per player, so you can hypothetically steal a life from both player A and player B within those 2 minutes, since they each have separate cooldowns. If a player has 2 or fewer lives, they have what is known as a 2 life safeguard, meaning their lives cannot be donated any further unless they choose to do so manually. On co-op, you can stand over your teammate's dead body in order to revive them quicker. Doing this will knock 2 seconds off their revive timer for every real second that passes. If you have multiple players standing over a downed teammate's body, it will revive them even faster. Having 2 players reviving someone at once will knock off 3 seconds per real second, and having 3 players reviving someone will knock out 4 seconds from the revive timer for every real second that passes. Also worth noting that the Fate of Divine Chalice allows you to revive teammates at a rate of 6 seconds per real second. On co-op, there is an AFK timer which kicks non-host players after approximately 6 minutes of inactivity. Even if you're moving around at times, the game will actually detect if you're not killing enemies very often or changing your inputs enough. So be sure to participate in the action on the map if you want to avoid being kicked. The AFK kick timer does not apply while inside the wild or at the end of rounds. If the host of the match is AFK for extended periods of time, they cannot be kicked for inactivity since they are host. However, they will be deemed ineligible for the Mama Back Trophy and colon cards. Furthermore, if you are AFK for an extended period of time, you will also lose the ability to earn XP in that match, even when in the wild. Players who are AFK for extended periods typically do not receive leaderboard credit either. If you disconnect from a match on co-op, you are typically able to rejoin the game and will retain your fates, score, score multiplier, and leaderboard progression as well. However, unless you join back before round 5, you will only come back with one speed boost to your name. There is sometimes a bug for top-down mode with this rejoin feature, where you have a permanent mini-map along with limited camera options, which prevent you from using the extra high camera view. If you encounter this bug, just back out of the match and rejoin again, but this time around, make sure to watch the full intro cutscene before loading in, which should solve the issue. For players who use keyboard and mouse as their input device, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. Firstly, you will be able to use gestures in-game, unlike users on controller. And secondly, whenever you defeat the Mama Back, you'll want to make sure that you watch the entire end cutscene. If you try skipping this cutscene while on keyboard and mouse, it will make it to where you have the pause menu overlay on your screen, effectively ruining your match. However, if you have a controller sitting around, you could plug it in, which typically allows you to navigate the menus and exit the pause screen, allowing you to then continue playing on keyboard and mouse without any issues. On solo, when you run out of lives, you are presented with a screen to trade in your keys for extra lives. You can trade in a maximum of 3 keys, which will then bring you back up to 2 lives. However, there are 3 important things to keep in mind with this trade-in program. Firstly, this trading can only be performed once during a match. Secondly, you cannot trade in your keys during the Mama Back boss fight. And thirdly, if you are presented with this trade-in screen, be sure not to pause your game and then press the back button, because the game will register the back button input as you declining to trade in your keys. If you happen to pause during this screen, 
Just make sure you press the start button instead in order to successfully unpause your match and continue on with your run. There are a few things to keep in mind related to the solo advanced start mode. The amount of lives and armory that you start with is dependent on what your arena checkpoint is. If you'd like to briefly pause the video, here's a list of the player's arsenal, depending on what round they are starting on in this mode. If you choose the Fate of Divine Shield during the Fate Stone selection screen, you will begin with one extra nuke compared to the numbers provided in the previous chart. Keep in mind, the highest level that you can start on for solo advanced start is round 61. Also, in this mode, you are guaranteed a bonus room after the first round that you play, so long as your starting checkpoint is not a super early round. Additionally, progress for your advanced start checkpoint is only tracked when you're playing under the solo playlist, rather than tracking any previous rounds you achieved in the private or local playlists. Now it's time to talk about tips and information related to bonus areas in DOA3. In the Weapon Depot bonus room, there are two hidden nukes located in the back left corner by the Death Machines. In the Weston's Trade and Post bonus room, there is a nuke in the top right corner and also another nuke in the bottom left corner. Additionally, there are two hidden speed boosts behind the counter in the top left. Also, if you spend a key on the present box over here, it will always award you with two extra lives. In the Chicken Nest bonus room, there is a 5% chance of a golden egg appearing, which is guaranteed to hatch into an extra life. In all bonus areas, including the Silverback Slideways and Cavernous Cellar, all weapons, shield items, and chickens do not start to expire until you enter the next round. In the War Store bonus room, if you want to save a few seconds, you can grab any vehicle, exit the vehicle, and then quickly leave the room on foot. Despite exiting from the vehicle, you will start the next round inside of the vehicle that you last selected. Also, in this bonus room, I would recommend taking either the Chopper or Mech, as they each last 10 seconds longer than the tank. Finally, it's worth mentioning that there are two nukes on each side of the room. In the Abandoned Temple bonus area, on co-op, you could have a teammate stand on the pressure plate in order to reveal two portals. Then you could go through one of the open portals with a 50-50 gamble as to whether you awarded some goodies or have some of your stuff taken away from you. If you get the good outcome of Fortune Favors You, your player will receive one life, two nukes, two speed boosts, some chickens, and a random purple weapon. If you get this reward after the wild, the weapons awarded to you will last for a total of seven minutes. Sometimes a 7 minute buffer doesn't seem to work, so it either kicks in after a certain round, or it's just a bit wonky and inconsistent. The bad outcome is of course, you must suffer for a while, where you will lose up to 4 speed boosts, 7 nukes, and 1 key, along with your movement being slowed for a short period of time as well. You can actually utilize the abandoned temple pressure play on solo as well, but it's a lot more luck dependent. If you have 9 lives and are close to earning enough points for yet another life, there's a 1 in 3 chance that you're awarded a skeleton army as a reward, which you want to land on the pressure plate. This will allow you to enter the portal as the skeletons activate the pressure plate. There's also a second way of utilizing the pressure plate on solo. This method is pretty difficult to replicate as well, as it requires killing the Megaton directly on the pressure plate, which typically causes the Megaton to split in half. While the Megaton is in its splitting animation, you can quickly use the speed boost towards the closest portal, just in time before the Megaton splits walk away from the pressure plate. And for our final tip in this video, whenever you discover an arcade machine during normal arenas, you will be guaranteed a silverback slideways after that round, unless you pick up the arcade machine during a nighttime round, in which case, you will have to play another round before encountering the bonus area. Apart from this feature, there is essentially no pattern or way to guarantee a bonus room in DOA3, as it is random. Generally speaking, the player has a 15% chance of discovering a bonus room at the end of a round, although these odds slightly improve the longer you progress without hitting a bonus room. Anyways, that about wraps up this 100 tips and tricks video. There's obviously more tips that could be shared, but we're not trying to have this video last for over an hour. <laughs> Anyways, if you learned something new about the game from this video, don't forget to drop a like. Thanks for watching.